The Secret Garden of George Washington Carver. This book is written by Jean Beretta, illustrated by Frank Morrison. Washington, D.C., 1921. George Washington Carver addresses the U.S. Congress. We are just beginning to learn the value of the peanut, Carver told the congressman. Some of them laughed. One man made a racist remark. As a black man speaking to a room of all white representatives, Carver was not among friends. African Americans were still segregated by U.S. federal law and treated as second-class citizens. Carver had been given only 10 minutes to speak. He gave the audience 10 minutes they would never forget. Carver showed them how peanuts could be used to make dozens of items, including face cream, soaps, ink, cheese, instant coffee, paper, paints, glue, and much more. When his time was up, they were impressed. The chairman encouraged him to continue. Go ahead, brother. Your time is unlimited. Carver spoke for over an hour. From the time he was a boy, he had a deep desire to share what he knew. So then why did he once have a secret garden? Diamond Grove, Missouri, 1874. No one knew about the garden George kept hidden on the Carver farm. No one saw how the child cared for his flowers and how much he loved them. When he watered the clovers, their petals curved up like a smile. The black-eyed Susans winked when he patted the soil around their roots. He sang to the dandelions, and they waved to him with their long leaves. People used to tell him that growing flowers was a foolish waste of time. Why don't you grow something you can eat, neighbors said. You can't make any money selling flowers, said his brother James. They're only good for attracting bees. Don't let flowers take you away from your chores, warned Moses and Susan Carver. George was born in 1864. Like his mother and his brother, he was enslaved on the Carver farm. While still a baby, George and his mother were kidnapped. Days later, he was found close to death and brought back to the Carvers. His mother was never seen again. The next year, slavery was outlawed in the United States. Moses and Susan Carver did not have children of their own and raised George and his brother on the farm. George was a sickly child, which meant less time working and more time exploring. He filled the house with a steady stream of interesting plants and rocks. Susan taught him how to be creative with the little they had. Nothing was wasted. Turkey feathers were used to make sewing needles. They made dyes from nuts and berries. They used plants and leaves for medicine. Every day he ran into the woods to discover something new. I want to know the name of every stone and flower and insect and bird and beast, he said. Education was limited at home. George had only one book, which he read dozens of times. I know this book by heart, he told Susan. I wish I could go to school with the white children. Slavery had ended, but U.S. segregation laws still denied black people the same rights as whites. George decided to create his own classroom in the woods and study the subject he loved most, nature. And no matter how much people discouraged him, 
he wanted to grow flowers. George decided to grow them in a secret garden so no one could find them or tease him. It became a magical place for him. Tiny seeds went into the dirt and transformed into beautiful flowers. In his mind, the garden was a true gift from God, whom he called the Great Creator. Each day, George rolled the soil between his fingers to make sure it wasn't too wet or too dry. Some plants needed more rain and some needed more sun. Come here, you need a haircut, George said as he cradled a daisy in his hand and clipped off its dry petals. He spread them around the soil to help the flowers grow. At first the gardening was difficult because he couldn't ask for help and reveal his secret. The more he experimented, the more he learned. George studied each new season by painting the life cycles of the flowers. Berries were used to make paints. Twigs and grass were used to make brushes. He learned how to protect the roots through the winter so flowers could be reborn in the spring. Welcome back, he whispered to the tiny sprouts. It was a special garden and could have remained secret forever. But eventually, the young boy's generosity changed that. When George met a neighbor with a sick plant or flower, he offered to care for it. Part of his garden became a plant hospital. Wilting plants went in and blooming plants came out. No one could believe that such a small child had so many big ideas. Here comes the plant doctor, they'd say whenever he paid a visit. Think of all the people I can help, he told the garden. It inspired him to see their flowers growing side by side with his flowers. George breathed a sigh of relief. There's no need to be secret anymore. George knew there was much to see and learn away from the farm. At the age of 12, he said goodbye to his garden and set off on his own for a new adventure. In Neosho, Missouri, he lived with Mariah Watkins, who gave him advice he carried into adulthood. Learn all you can, George, then give it all back to our people. Over the next 18 years, he lived in several states and attended many schools to study art and agriculture. It was not easy. After being accepted to Highland College in 1885, the all-white school refused to admit him when they learned he was African American. But the young man was determined to get an education. In 1896, George Washington Carver became the first black man to study at graduate from and teach at Iowa Agricultural College. The same year, Booker T. Washington, president of the Tuskegee Institute, hired him to teach agriculture. When Carver first arrived, he said, everything looked hungry, the land, the cotton, the cattle, the people. Farmers were in trouble. Cotton crops were destroying their land. With little money and second-rate equipment, Carver built Tuskegee's first farming laboratory. He experimented with new crops to replace cotton, like sweet potatoes and soybeans. But the peanut was his champion. It had nutrients to nourish and refresh the soil. He convinced farmers to grow peanuts and then developed over 300 uses for them. It wasn't long before peanuts became the largest crop in the South. Carver also created a traveling schoolhouse called the Jessup Agricultural Wagon to visit poor farmers. It offered everything from tool demonstrations to medical care to pamphlets on how to improve farms and live healthier. In its first summer, the wagon visited over 6,000 people. 
Carver's advice saved countless farms and families. What would you like to learn today? He asked a farmer. The best time to plow or how to raise a strong cow? Wherever he traveled, people went to hear him speak. After his historic day in front of the US Congress, he became a living folk hero. He was also recognized as an early environmentalist, a voice for racial harmony and an advisor to world leaders. With his new fame came many awards and honors. Yet he remained a humble man, always ready to serve humanity. Since his days on the Carver farm, one thing never changed. Day after day, I spent in the woods alone in order to collect my floral beauties and put them in my little garden I had hidden in the brush not far from the house. Regard nature, revere nature, respect nature. George Washington Carver.